For confidentiality, our paranormal witness's identity will be kept private. She'll be known as Miss X throughout this episode. Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques went out of business due to the coronavirus pandemic shortly before Humboldt Paranormal conducted this investigation. Miss X, the owner of the store, was kind enough to allow Humboldt Paranormal to investigate her unit before her tenancy there expired. The store that took the place of this address after Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques moved out is known as the Epitome Gallery. This unit is located at 420 2nd Street in Eureka, California. Here is an interview of the lead investigator of Humboldt Paranormal, Rupin Boteo, and a summary of his experiences and observations of the paranormal investigation of Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques that took place in February of 2021. Well, what happened? Uh, I'm the lead investigator of Humboldt Paranormal, and we investigated Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Unique store in downtown Eureka. And what did you observe? We seemed to get to about 265 spirit box responses, which were was a lot of responses. And we also got a lot of responses using uh, the Flux2 response device. The video footage appeared to have captured possible spirit orbs as well in, in that in this investigation. What impacts the way you view the situation and experience? So I am a Christian. You know, I hold my Bible, my little pocket Bible in my pocket when I go on investigations. So when I do ghost hunting, my Christian beliefs basically affect my view on the paranormal investigations and also possibly on what I'm possibly making contact with. I don't know if what's possibly communicating to us are human souls or if they're possibly demons pretending to be human souls. I know there is a Christian view that human souls don't really exist. Or they only exist in heaven or hell, but not on our planet Earth. Hard to say what these might be. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you. Due to extenuating circumstances, the other two investigators of this investigation, Eliza and Zach Rouse, were not able to provide an interview for this episode. Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques is located in Eureka, California. Before Eureka was colonized by white settlers, it was inhabited by the indigenous people of the Wiat tribe. From 1579 to 1849, during the time that European settlers explored what is now the Northern California coast, they kept missing the sighting of Humboldt Bay because of a combination of geographic features and weather conditions, which concealed its narrow entrance from view. Despite a well-documented sighting in 1806 of the bay by Russian explorers, the bay was not known definitively by Europeans until an overland exploration in 1849 provided a reliable accounting of it. The Humboldt Bay is the second largest bay in California behind the San Francisco Bay. Due to this discovery, the settlement of Eureka was founded on May 13, 1850 by the Union and Mendocino Exploring Companies. After the initial California gold rush in the Sierra Nevada mountains, Humboldt Bay was settled with the purpose of providing an easier route to supply miners on the Trinity, Klamath, and Salmon rivers where gold had been discovered than the long overland route from Sacramento. The natural shipping channels near Humboldt Bay solidified Eureka as the primary city on the bay. Eureka derived its name from the Greek word meaning, I have found it. The roots of the development of Eureka originated with the gold rush. Many of the initial immigrants mining for gold were also lumbermen. Many hopeful gold miners realized how difficult and infrequent it was to strike it rich searching for gold, so they turned to another resource on the bay, which was its seemingly endless redwood forests to be made into lumber. The timber industry started taking off just four years after Eureka's founding in 1854, and grew rapidly and exponentially. A bustling commercial district rose near the waterfront, reflecting the great prosperity experienced during this era. 
Old Town Eureka, the original downtown center of this busy city in the 19th century, has been restored and become a lively art center. Old Town Eureka has been declared an historic district by the National Register of Historic Places. The district is made up of over 150 buildings, which represents much of Eureka's original 19th century core commercial center. The building where Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques is located was built in 1880 during this bustling time of timber industry prosperity. It was originally built for Jay McLaughlin as a restaurant and saloon. It is said that a boxing school used to be above where Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques was, but then it became the Alpine Rooms, which was a brothel. In 1886, the building that Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques is located in was primarily listed as a saloon and secondarily as gambling rooms. In 1889, the building that Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques is located in was listed as a saloon. On top of Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques, which used to be the Alpine Hotel, now currently serves as apartment homes for residents. Alpine Hotel was a brothel and is listed as a Eureka Historic Landmark as the longest running Bordeo in Eureka, California. In 1925, an arch was cut through the brick wall separating the building where Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques was and the High Lead Saloon next door, where Eureka Books now is, connecting the two. During this time, the building where Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques was was considered a part of the High Lead Saloon. This archway stayed there for six to seven years before it was sealed in 1931 to 1932. The High Lead Saloon is now known as Eureka Books and was owned by Tom Slaughter in the early part of the 20th century. In the upper floor area of the same building was a second saloon called the Louvre Cafe, which was owned by Fred Carter. Tom Slaughter and Fred Carter were business partners, although it was said that they did not work well together and would frequently get into physical fights with each other over issues such as money. It is said that the building in which these two saloons were housed in was among the most violent places in Eureka back in the 1930s. The High Lead Saloon had frequent stabbings that took place there. The most risque burlesque show also took place in this building. A police officer sat down at the High Lead Saloon every night in order to prevent any fights from breaking out between the two owners. On June 3, 1933, Tom Slaughter and Fred Carter had an argument, it is said over money, and Tom Slaughter chased Fred Carter down the staircase leading to the rear alleyway entrance of the Louvre Cafe and shot and killed Fred Carter just as Fred reached this door exit. The original sign of the alleyway entrance to Fred Carter's Louvre Cafe still stands to this day. Tom Slaughter's lawyer managed to have him acquitted of all charges. Unfortunately, Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques was set to move out of this building in one week due to the coronavirus lockdowns putting it out of business. The clutter in the store is due to Miss X packing her belongings. Thankfully, Miss X allowed us to investigate her unit before her store moved out in a week. Um, so you would, would look back in here, would you walk around? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, we're actually, well, Probably. I'm hoping we, well, I don't know how long you're willing to let it stay here, but no, that's fine. Um, I, I was trying to get this uh, interview done as soon as I could so you can, you don't have right. to, you can do whatever you okay. gotta do. Um, there's a, a checklist I was hoping that we might be able to go through. Hopefully it won't take that long. Um, I was hoping to kind of make like a general map of the area and like just look at different things like uh, like check the doors, see if they make any noises or if they're easy to open. Because what we would do, we don't have to do this with us. Right. Yeah. Maybe check the windows. Uh... I can tell you if it's really windy outside, one of these windows over here has a crack in the corner mm -hmm. and, it, and it's just this raining. Oh, it's 
object that flew off, you said horizontally, in the air? Yeah, and this happened more than once. About how many times would you say? Uh, three, that I can remember. It was always a first. We always had firsts with our top. The first time, this was probably three years ago maybe, uh, I had about, I think it was a Saturday, I had probably six, eight customers in here, and all of a sudden this purse come flying off of the top of the cabinet and landed somewhere in here. And there were other times when I would come in after being closed for the night or over the weekend and find purses on the floor. Well, I, I know some of the customers were kind of stunned, like, you know, what just happened? There was only one purse each time. Were there more than one purse on here at the time? There's usually two to three, maybe four, once in a while. Did everyone in the store think it was paranormal based? I don't really know. I'm not sure. When the purses flew off, where were you? Were you close by? I was behind, behind the counter. What, another time when it happened was someone had just walked out the door and I was, I think, walking back from the door because I had said goodbye to him and the purse come flat down. And when you saw it with your uh, peripheral vision, you could see something literally flying out, yeah. like, like something yeah. being thrown. Like someone batted it, you know? I think we have what we need for this second location. I've had a couple things happen mm -hmm. behind the counter. Um, you know, I've seen shadows, you know, uh, from side vision, but I, it seems to me like someone's walking behind me, but I'm the only one in the store. Um, I've Gotten ready to leave, have my stuff ready, keys on the counter, purse on the counter, whatever, and coat on the back of the chair, and go to grab something, you know, whether it's my keys or my coat, whatever, and all of a sudden it's not there, and I search, and I search, and I search, and I know it was just there a minute ago, and I'll look and walk all over the store and walk in the back and can't find it, and all of a sudden, turn around, and there's my keys. Yeah, you know, and I, I know I know the one time that I couldn't find my coat. My coat was on the back of that chair all day long, and I had never moved it. And I got ready to leave, and it was cold like it is now. I didn't want to go out without my coat. And I couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. I searched all over the place. I mean, there's only two or three places I put a coat when I come in. And went back there and looked around and stuff and come back out. There it is on the chair. Now, it hadn't been there before. I know it wasn't there. And I'm sorry, nobody else was in the store at the time? or Not that I remember, no. I, I was getting ready to go. When you saw it there again, was it in the same manner as it was uh -uh. From the first it time? Was, it was kind of, I had taken and draped it over the chair like you would normally. It was kind of just flopped over the chair. So, so the second time you saw it, it looked different in yeah. the way it was on the chair than the first yeah. time? Yeah. And you, said, you mentioned something about shadows, right? Like shadow mm -hmm. people? Yeah. When you, when you saw the shadows in your peripheral vision, were they white, black, or in color? Dark. Dark? Darker, yeah. Did the apparition disappear all at once, or did it gradually or simply move out of sight? Just kind of moved out of sight. Can I ask just one question? Absolutely. Did it, did it feel like the, what was the shadow that was passing you, that it had an intent? Or did it just sort of feel like maybe it was just sort of um, 
a, a non sentient uh, yeah. thing. Yeah, you know, just he was, you know, passing by. You know, I didn't feel like it was after me or mm -hmm. here to hurt me or scare me or anything else. Just something I caught out of the corner of my eye. And the lights were fully on during this time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Do you feel like whatever those shadows might have been had something to do with um, your jacket disappearing and reappearing on the chair? Um, they, it didn't happen at the same time, so... Do you feel like they're connected in any way? Not necessarily. Okay, I think we have what we need from this location. I think I've heard some noises back there before. Can I especially, like I said, more towards the back? Say this is a closet area? Uh, well, we've always called it the storage area. Um, I don't know what other businesses use it as. I don't know when the wall was put in. Did you say there was an audible voice back here? Um, not really a voice. I just, I've heard noises or um, maybe like someone clearing their throat or a giggle maybe once in a while or, you know, an odd noise. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what it was. Did it seem close by or far away? Um... I think I was standing about where you're at at the dresser and the giggle seemed like it was farther back by the refrigerator probably. Oh, over there. Okay, yeah. so... It, I kind of always sense that the whatever is going on, it's more towards the refrigerator and back past the refrigerator. That whatever is hanging out is hanging out past the refrigerator there in that other little room. I think we probably have what we need from this area. Yeah, I had been out this door. It wasn't that far. Because you go out, uh, there's a little closet here. There used to be a table here. And then you kind of jog over, you go down the hallway, and you go out the alley door. Um, and then there's a stairway that goes up to the apartment above. So I was doing something I, I had a plan, and I had heard banging up above me off and on all night. I knew the tenant wasn't home. So I thought, they were out of town. I thought, I don't quite know what's going on. All of a sudden, I heard the most evil laugh at the top of the stairs that would have went up to the apartment that I've ever heard in my life. And whatever I was doing, I put it down. I walked in here. I locked this. I went and grabbed my keys. I went out the front door. I locked the front door. I walked all the way around the building, got my car, Drove right from the front, come in, loaded my stuff in my car, and I went home. That was, you know, hmm. it, it really did freak me out. Wow. That was the only time I was really freaked out. I was out this door, hmm. and whatever it was, I know it came from the top of the stairs, because um, this used to be the back entrance to the brothel, and the brothel was upstairs. Well, it's been remodeled since then, so if you go up the stairs, you go to like a sunroom, you pass through it, and then you go onto a deck, and then you can go into the back door of the apartment. Mm -hmm. But there's a gate, so I couldn't go up there if I wanted to, you know, unless I wanted to climb it. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they would, the tenant upstairs wasn't using this really, and the property manager didn't care, so I used it for storage and to come and go. And it was a very evil, mean laugh. And that was, I was it. <laughs> I was just done. Did it sound like uh, female or male? Male. 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 So, it was male. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was the only time I've ever you know, experienced a man or anything, or really anybody in this area. Interesting. It, you know, late at night, one o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's a little creepy back here. It's always cold. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it never really freaked me out mm -hmm. until that night. And that was. So that felt more negative than the Oh, others. very much so. And um, I think probably for a good couple of months, I did not um, go into this area at night except for to, to come and go. I, I know it's kind of funny to ask you to imitate it, but like if you were to, it, like, or compare it. Like, like <laughs> just like that, yeah. or pretty much. And it was yeah. clear? Like oh, very clear. Wow. That was probably the clearest thing I've ever heard in here. You know, the tenant would kind of check in with me. And he had contacted me like the day before that he was going to be out of town for the next week or whatever. And I 
knew there should be anyone else up there. Did it sound like an older man or a younger man or like any age? Did it no, a kid? No, no. no, I'm not a kid. No. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would think a middle aged or older, I don't know. I don't know that it sounded threatening, mm -hmm. but I definitely got the impression like it wanted to go away. Oh, okay. so like it was aware of you specifically? Yeah, I kind of think so. Like, I almost wondered later if that's what the banking, banking was about, was maybe they were they're trying to get me to go away, but I had work to do. And it didn't seem like it was responding to something you said, maybe? Uh -huh. And it wasn't, didn't seem like it was asking for a response? Uh -huh. And it was definitely a, a good banging, you know, like I would have assumed that someone was trying to pound something on a wall or um, or pound on a wall, you know, and it happened several times over the course of probably two, three hours before I heard the laugh. So the pounding was farther away, but the, the laugh was closer? Uh-huh. I just kept on thinking, what's that noise? Because I know the tenant's not here. And after the tenant returned, I did check with him to make sure that he didn't have a friend staying or, you know, whatever, and he did not. I'm sorry, do you remember what date that you had this particular experience in? Approximately, or how, approximately how long ago? Uh, probably three to four years ago. And, I'm sorry, and the time of day of, the, of the, this experience? This was probably, I would say, somewhere between 11 and 1 in the morning. 11 p.m. to 1, wow, that late, that freaky. Great. Is there any uh, further description of this particular experience you want to give? No. Do you have any other locations? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow, that's a lot to go on. Humble Paranormal managed to make contact with the tarot reader who provided her services for Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques, Reverend Kristen Bradfield, who also serves as an interfaith minister. Here, Humble Paranormal interviews Kristen regarding her own set of paranormal experiences that she experienced in the store. So as you know that we did an investigation at Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques for Humble Paranormal um, for a paranormal investigation. Yes. And it is our understanding that you worked with in her store, you, you, I think you did some tarot card readings? Tarot, yes. Tarot? Uh -huh. um, and I don't work for her. She allowed me to use a portion of the space. If I remember correctly, she said something about you would do tarot readings during like Halloween and events like um, that? It was an occasional weekend thing. We tried to make it a weekly thing and uh, didn't really have the market for it, not enough walk-through traffic. So it turned into a once a month thing and then we stopped uh, during when COVID first started showing up. Uh, we put that to rest for a while and next thing I knew she'd moved on so. So you've had some paranormal um, encounter or and paranormal experiences in her store? Oh yes. Can you describe what happened? There were things moving without a reason for them to move. There was a row of handbags on top of uh, an old china cabinet that I was next to and uh, they kept falling over. At one point, one of them fell on the floor right in front of me. There were noises that could not be accounted for, um, and the store was riddled with uh, moving cold spots and hot spots. When you saw things moving, you actually looked directly at them and you saw them moving? Generally, I'd hear a noise and then look in that direction until I saw what it was. And what was unique about that space was that things would make a little noise and then seem to wait for me to look over there and then do it again rather than it being something that happened and then it took them days to come up with enough energy to do it again. It was methodical almost. Uh, what was really unique about the place was the first time I was there I sat right next to that that was the day with the purses. Uh, well, I woke up in the middle of the night after going home and I had vertigo like you couldn't imagine. I, I just trying to get from the bedside to the bathroom was a matter of grabbing one piece of furniture and pulling myself along because it was very much like being in a drastically pitching ship. So I made a point in subsequent visits and when I was working in the store to not set up my table. I just, whatever it was in that space, walked home with me. So I would set up in a different spot and, and didn't have the same symptoms ever again. There was an odd occurrence when I was taking notes 
from someone where it felt like something was pulling pulled the pin out of my hand. And I just laughed about it and said, oh, I dropped the pin. But it, it literally felt like something pulled the pin out of my hand. It did not want me writing it down. And this was in Buzzard's Nest this store? This in Buzzard's Nest. I used to have a sign-up sheet, you know, so people could request contact later on or whatever. And uh, when I was setting it up, just writing out the chart, you know, name, address, phone number, and putting in a couple of lines and some numbers so people would know where to sign up. That, it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> what learning occurred for you in this experience at Buzzard's Nest Antiques and Uniques? Probably that was the first time that I've had something physically affect me to the point where I wondered if I was having a stroke or something. It was memorable because I was sitting there and the purse is falling like this. So it's like, oh! So did it... Interesting. Did it fall vertical or did it move horizontal? It, it and didn't then... just tip over and mm -hmm. fall because it, it didn't go down right next to the thing. It sort of moved like, like this. Horizontal it in the air? A, it had, yeah, it like had a, a little bit of an arc to it. So something propelled it. Um, it wasn't just a gravitational fall. We came up with a different place for the for the handbags and it stopped happening. So. Oh, so when you move the handbags to a different location, then it stopped happening? It's a, yeah, th nothing else that I was aware of ever came off the top. But maybe it did, I don't know. I just didn't, not when I was there. Okay. Uh, wow, you gave a fascinating interview. Um, I think that pretty much concludes my interview. Kind of show us in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're so. here at Buzzard's Nest, 422nd Street in Eureka. Uh, what time is it right now, Eliza? It's 11.30. It's 11.30 and we're going to turn the lights off um, pretty That's quickly off. here. Yeah. Um, and we, one of our goals, I think, is to try to see if the spirits are willing to move these purses on top of this case for us. Uh, which was uh, something that our witness had, had told us uh, was an episode, that when there was a number of customers in here with her, uh, a purse flew across the room from, from that case where you see it right now. So we're hoping that they will, they will do this trick with us. Yeah, and we're going to do our best to just kind of really listen mm -hmm. and see what we hear. And is there anything that you would like to mention, Aleta? Um, no, I'm excited to go lights out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, all right. All right, well, I guess we will go ahead and get started. Thank you, thank you both. In this scene, we are using a Flex 2 response device. This device is a binary sensor alarm that uses lights and sound. One light is colored green and the other light is colored red. If one side detects motion, it flashes a green light along with a high beeping sound, and if the opposite side detects motion, it flashes a red light along with a low beeping sound. The spirit can decide what side of the device to move near to in order to answer green or red. So we are going to try to communicate with the spirit using this binary device. Here we are in front of the glass case. So we're in front of the glass case with the purses, up on top. And here is Eliza and Zach. And I am here as well. Okay. We'd really appreciate it if you'd come over and turn on the screen light for us. We're here to listen to you. We want to hear your story. Perfect. Okay. Notice how far everyone was from the Flex2 response device when it first blinked green, and right after Zach asked whatever spirit might be present to blink it green. Okay, so now that should be good to go. <laughs> cool. Yeah. If there's anyone here with us, a spirit, can you move near this device to make it detect you? Preferably on the green side. However, you can move on any side, but preferably this side with the green light. OK. 
Can you let your presence be known by moving where that green light is on that device, on this pyramid triangle device? Oh my God. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, there was no one near the Flux 2 response device as it blinked green. Here, Ruben is starting the S-Box Ghost Box and Recorder for live and real-time contact with spirits. The theory is that the spirits use the energy of the radio transmission signals to form words and sentences in order to speak to us in real time through the Ghost Box. A ghost box is a radio device specifically designed for paranormal investigation that rapidly switches through all the radio stations on whatever frequency the spirit box is set to in order to generate radio signals that the spirits can use to communicate with us in real time. Spirit messages from the ghost box, also known as electronic voice phenomena or EVPs for short, are categorized into one of three classes, which are class A, Class B or Class C. Class A EVPs are very easy to understand, can be heard without headphones, and people can generally agree on its content. Class B EVPs needs headphones to distinguish the message content, and not everyone will agree on the message. Class C EVPs requires headphones, often needs amplification and filtering, and will rarely ever get heard by others. It is said that spirits require a good deal of energy to communicate to us, and they only have so much energy available. When they have lots of energy available, it is said that they can communicate giving Class A EVPs. During times when they have less energy, they might give out a Class B or Class C EVP instead. What's your name? Maybe. Paul? Is your name Paul? The humble paranormal investigators make their way toward the back of the store. Is there a spirit back here? Is the spirit of 
Tom Slaughter here with us. Tom Slaughter. I ask you to come here to speak with us. Tom Slaughter, do you feel guilty for murdering Fred Carter? Here, we are investigating the storage hallway to the rear and side of the front desk. This is a hallway where our witness claims that she strongly felt the presences of spirit, a spirit that was confused and sad. Um, and we're trying the binary device here in the same storage area to see if we get any results. And it's not resetting itself because it's just going nonstop. Right. So there's something here. Possibly. Can you, if there's something here, here, can you choose a side? Right now you're choosing both sides. Can you just choose a side? 
Thank you. Oh my god, it chose a side. The green side. So this is the fridge, the refrigerator that our witness said she stated she sensed a spirit back here. And she also sensed it back in this closet area beyond the doorway. So we put the binary device in there. Are there any spirit people here with us? If so, can you touch that triangle shaped device that I'm pointing at that's glowing blue? Can you get near it? Let us know that you're here. We really like you and we want to get to know you a little better. Can you please touch that green side? We're really excited to hear from you. I know it takes a lot of energy. Okay. We're going to try to communicate with you using this spirit box. Hello. Hello. Thanks for talking with us. What is your name? Oh, I got to get a report. What's your name? the 1920s, the 1930s? How many spirit people are in this hallway down to the storage, in the storage area? Over 10? Could this be giving a clue as to what happened between Fred Carter and Tom Slaughter? 
Perhaps Fred Carter paid Tom Slaughter whatever money he owed him, but Tom Slaughter was still not satisfied, and Fred Carter was unwilling or unable to pay him more, and perhaps that is why Tom Slaughter murdered Fred Carter? Oh, what happened? Went off. Oh, it looks like the battery died. Did the battery die? Oh, darn. I guess so. Here, we are conducting a spirit communication and ghost box session in the front part of the store where the glass cabinet is located that held purses which somehow flew off the cabinet all on their own on multiple occasions in front of Miss X and her customers during the day. Eliza placed a video camera in the storage hallway behind and to the side of the front desk while we were performing the ghost box session in the front part of the store in front of the glass cabinet. Here are the highlights from Eliza's video footage. So it was reported to us by the tenant here that, that some of you spirits or one of you spirits uh, pushed a purse off of the top of this glass cabinet. We are wondering if you can repeat that for us right now. Can you push a purse? one of those three purses off the glass cabinet in the same way you did before for and some of her customers. Can I sing like a Christian song that's been known to be like a powerful song as a Christian song? Sure. sure. Okay. Jesus loves me, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells us so. Ding, ding. It says no. <laughs> <laughs> what it, oh, did it say what's up? Yeah. Do you not, do you not, do you not like that song? It's red. It did? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, it's red. If you don't, uh, oh if, my god. If you don't like that song, turn it red again. Did the spirits not like the Jesus Loves Me song? The Flux 2 response device turned red. Are you able to push one of these purses off 
this glass cabinet physically. There was no visible spirit orb activity for a long period of time. When a spirit orb did finally show up again and glided toward the side of the camcorder where the flashlight was located, the flashlight turned immediately off. Did a spirit turn the flashlight off? Eliza just realized that the flashlight that she set to the side of her video camera in the storage hallway was off, even though she turned and left it on to provide illumination for her video camera filming the storage hallway. It, it, it's not dead. Mm. I can see if the battery was dead, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Eliza found that the battery in the flashlight that turned off near her video camera still had a lot of power left. So, what could have turned her flashlight off? You guys were asking a lot of questions. I know. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean. I, I'm just curious. Yeah, I'm just curious to see what answers we get. Like, 